For those of you who don't know me, my name is Isaac Bryan. That was one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Shout out to SJLI. And she said I went through a lot today. I was flying from Colorado Springs. I had to go through Denver. My plane got delayed till two. I got a different flight. My stuff is still in Denver. <laughs> but I wanted to be here. I wanted to be here because this conference and this conversation is important. And it's arguably more important now than it's ever been. And I wanted to see y'all in person. I've been missing people, especially my brothers right up here. So it's good to be with y'all. I am the second newest member of the State Assembly. I'm the youngest black member of the State Assembly. You know, don't let, don't let the beard and shaved head fool you. I'm still 29. And I didn't ask permission to get where I am. I put in the work. And the community validated that with this election. And that work in the equity space has kind of been my entire life. I grew up in a big family. How many of y'all got brothers and sisters? Ain't nobody only child in here. I see one only child in here. <laughs> I got 13 of them with my last name. Another six that could claim a parent of mine. The reason being, I was adopted as a kid. I was adopted into a family that did foster care for 26 years. And hundreds of foster brothers and sisters. Been to 11 different schools, including that middle school I failed out of. Nine of us were adopted. And my adopted parents, they took the hardest cases always. The kids who went through the most trauma and were difficult to place or had the highest special needs. So my little brother has cerebral palsy, autism. One of my brothers has a shunt from his brain to his stomach to, uh, to, to help move fluid out of his brain. And if it ever fails, he's in serious trouble. It failed one time. It's hard to notice from the outside. He wasn't supposed to actually live for more than a couple of years. He came to the house because my mom couldn't stand to see him in a hospital. He's 17 now. He's gonna keep going. I say that to say because equality wasn't a thing in my house. One, because we knew the world wasn't equal. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been through the things we've been through. But equity was the only way we looked at things. Why does, why does Brad get the biggest plate of food? Because Brad came from a home where food scarcity and hunger was, was a very real thing. Why does Evan get more attention uh, than I do? Because Evan has a shunt from his brain to his stomach and we gotta keep an eye on him all the time. That all made perfect sense to us growing up. You meet people where they are and you feel those needs based on past trauma, past damage. And it all doesn't have to be equal across the board because that's not actually equal for people who need more. And I would argue that for black, brown, poor, and indigenous folks, we need more. For women in this country, we need more. For LGBTQ plus people, we need more. And that's kind of guided my work. So I went to UCLA because I figured that was the place where I could learn how to go get us more. I got there, I was the only black man in my program. Dr. Turner can tell you something about that. I searched around campus to try to find a home. I found a home in the, the Ralph J. Bunch Center. The Bunch Center at UCLA is the only black organized research unit in the entire UC system. Think of it as like the Cal State Dominguez Hills of UCLA, <laughs> right? That's our, that's our home right there. That's where we get to go. And from there, I linked up with a professor. Her name was Dr. Carolina Hernandez, and we started doing some crazy research. How many of y'all heard of a project called Million Dollar Hoods? If you haven't, you should. Let me tell you what we did. We asked the LAPD and the Sheriff's Department for all of their arrests and bookings, ever. And they politely told us no. So we followed up with a lawsuit, and we won. And the settlement was all of that data. Unfiltered, raw, give us everything. We cleaned it up ourselves and we ran analysis on it. Let me tell you some of the things we found in that analysis. The first was something we already knew. Policing is not equitable. <laughs> it's not equal, <laughs> but it certainly ain't equitable. One in five arrests from the LAPD is someone who is unhoused. We took that report to the police commission. 
You know what the number one charge for our brothers and sisters who are unhoused was at that time? Failure to appear. That's what we were locking folks up for. One in five arrests. Now y'all know the unhoused population, our houses, brothers and sisters, black folks are 8% of the city and the county of Los Angeles. What percent do you think of our unhoused population is black? Nearly 50, over 40. That's not equitable. Damn sure ain't equal. So we started organizing around that with LA Can and many others, thinking about how can we reverse this trend? And then we went deeper into the data. We looked at policing on school campuses. Y'all know LAUSD has the largest school police force anywhere in the country. Had a $75 million budget at the time. We wrote a report and we found out that one in four arrests by the school police was a child who was 12 years old or younger. At a time in California when you couldn't prosecute children under the age of 12, why are we arresting them at school? Number one charge, public disturbance. I still don't know what that means in a school context. I was a public disturbance my entire education, I'm sure of it. Over a third of the arrests were black students, despite only being 8% of the school population, and black girls far and away more police contact than all other girls in schools. I took that report. I went straight to Superintendent Butner at the time. I said, what's up with this? He said, what you want to do about it? I said, oh, I got some ideas. I called Joseph Williams. I called my organizing friends. I called the Brother Son Sales Coalition. I called SJLI, literally. D'Artagnan Scorza sat at the table with me, with George Weaver, and we ran a task force for damn near two years with LAUSD, encouraging them to think outside of policing students. We had models like Toronto, the largest school district in Canada that had done away with their police department in 2016, before George Floyd was murdered. And they had intervention workers from the community who had been to those schools, who knew the neighborhoods and knew the conditions the kids were living in, who could keep peace on campus every bit as well as any kind of law enforcement officer without any of the stigma or traumatization. That's what we suggested for the school district. It took the murder of George Floyd Millions of us in the streets. How many of y'all were in the streets? We was in the streets. Still in the streets. And major protests outside of the school board headquarters. These two brothers was there. And that's what happened. There are no more school police officers on LAUSD's campus. They still have a police department, but we took $25 million from it, a third of the budget, and reinvested that money into black students. That's equity. I would say, though, for me, there's a distinction. You know, there's equality, then there's equity. The third step to me is justice. Because you can't really, I don't want equity in a system that was designed to subjugate and harm black, brown, poor, and indigenous bodies. That's an oxymoron. That's not a real thing. Justice, quite frankly, is the deconstruction of those kinds of systems and the reconstruction of systems of care, hope, and opportunity. We have those. We're standing in one right now. There's a lot of work to do. After I did that work with Million Dollar Hoods, got deeper into my organizing, built up the Black Policy Project, and then got a phone call from a number of community-based organizations. We had been marching, and everyone was talking, what's the policy solution? How do we get equity out of this situation? How do we get justice in this situation? And we came up with the idea to run Measure J. It wasn't called Measure J at the time. We wanted to go with Measure X because it sounded more radical and cool. I had to tell Dr. Abdullah no. <laughs> we ran Measure J for justice. And what Measure J did is it called for 10% of the county's unrestricted budget. That means the dollars they get to play with every year. After your rent's paid, after all your bills are paid, that's your free money. We wanted 10% of that to go to alternatives to incarceration, small business support, youth development, affordable housing. It's not a lot to ask for. But in the county of LA, how big how big do y'all think the budget is? Anybody know how big the budget is? 36 billion. Billy, with a billy billy. The unrestricted part, about eight billion. That's the free money we get to play with. Ten percent of that, that's eight hundred million dollars. We called for that to be invested in our communities every year forever. 
change the county constitution. We don't want to fight for this in the budget every year. We want this forever. We put it on the ballot, which is very hard to do. Had to raise three and a half million dollars in 15 weeks. Don't ask me how I did it. I caught a lot of rich people, but also a lot of everyday people. Everybody put in a lot of sweat equity into this. Nearly 200 organizations. We passed last November on the ballot, the same ballot Supervisor Mitchell was elected on, with 57% of the vote, 2.1 million yes votes. That's equity. I will say the Deputy Sheriff's Association has sued and blocked some of that money, but the County Board of Supervisors decided to invest over $185 million this year anyway into those same things. But we need more. The reason we need more is because when you talk about home ownership rates in California, 63% for white folks, 66% for AAPI communities, 44% for Latinx communities, 36.8% for black communities. And when you intersection look at it with female heads of households and other different ways that were stratified, the numbers get even worse. There's no equity there. When you talk about rent burden and rent share, you know, for the month of July, nearly 20% of black folks in the state of California had no confidence they could pay their rent. Not any. Equity in my mind was, okay, prevent folks from being evicted and pay their rent. We had $75 billion in extra money this year in the state of California, pay the rent. That's what we did. We blocked people from being evicted, we paid the rent. The only downside to it is it expired today and we're not in session anymore. And unless the governor calls a special session, there's nothing I can do about that. But if he did, I would vote yes to extend it because we don't have justice yet and people are still hurting. In my mind, equity and reparations go hand in hand. In my mind, equity and truth and reconciliation go hand in hand. We have to talk about the way that we're organized. We have to talk about the way life outcomes are predictable for third graders who don't know how to read yet. We have to talk about how a white man with a criminal background can still earn more than a black man without one. We have to talk about how you can be discriminated just for the name on your application. The last bill of the session this year was to put sunsets on convictions. If you had a criminal history in your background, but you had served all of your time and all of your time on supervision, parole or probation, which is hard as hell to do, and then four more years after that had no encounters with the criminal legal system that those convictions wouldn't show up on job applications or on background checks for housing, and you would get a chance to rebuild your life. One, I think that's way too long to clear those personally. But right now, they stay on your record until you are 99 years old. That bill didn't get out the assembly floor. We needed 41 votes to get out. We had 38. I was walking up and down the aisle, politely screaming at my colleagues. That's what California, that's where we're at as California right now. We're leading the country on many, 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 many things. We are the most progressive state by far, but we've got work to do. But I'm not gonna leave y'all just depressed. We also did some really, really big things this year, today being one of them. How many of y'all heard of SB2 or the decertification of the Kenneth Ross Jr. Bill? Three of y'all, that's good to know. I'm gonna put the rest of y'all on game. California is one of only four states where you can be fired from one department for misconduct and rehired at another law enforcement department. I can be on the LAPD, kill somebody, quite literally, get fired, have that shooting ruled out of policy by the commission, which is very hard to do, and then just go work for the Culver City Police Department. One of four states where that's allowed to happen. Not anymore. I co-sponsored that bill with Senator Stephen Bradford, who was leading the charge for two years, but really that bill was pushed by the families of those who had lost their lives to police violence. There's no reason we should be one of four states for anything that's bad. 
right? We're supposed to lead in California. Yesterday, I had a bill signed by the governor in Oakland, the AB 1043. It was my first bill, my first bill ever, which is not bad for only being there for like five months. <laughs> I got busy, y'all. Y'all understand. I put this, I put this on the table in my first six days. But what it does is it establishes an acute poverty category in our affordable housing laws for people who earn between zero and 15% of an area's median income. What that means in Los Angeles County is families that make $17,000 a year or less. There's over 180,000 families that make $17,000 a year or less. Now that this bill is law, their rents for affordable units have to be capped at no more than 30% of that income level. It's a big deal. It also means if you want to build affordable housing and you want to use my money, our money, state money, I can require that a percentage of those units be affordable housing units for people who earn zero to 15% of an area's median income. When you lift from the bottom, you lift everybody up. To me, that's equity. When you put your resources into communities and to people who have historically been denied access to resources and opportunity, that's equity. If you do it and abolish systems of harm and subjugation at the same time, that's justice. In California, I have a lot of hope. I ran for office because I had hope and because I'm crazy. I ran for office, I had no idea who was gonna support me and the community showed up and showed out and that gave me hope. I went into the legislature, we got the decertification bill through, we got AB 1043 through, we provided free school lunch for every student in all school districts all across the state of California, no matter what you look like or how much your parents made, we put $6 billion into internet access to make sure everyone can have access to affordable internet in the coming years. We put $12 billion into homelessness money, the largest investment the state has ever made. We sent it to the cities and the counties so we can get affordable units off the ground. In my district, we put $20 million into the VA to build 200 new units by next summer because there's veterans who are sleeping right outside of the VA because they have nowhere else to live. We put $5 million into radical black research at the UCLA Bunch Center. We put $5 million into the UCLA Law School to build up a reproductive justice center before Texas started doing that crazy stuff. We did some special things this year and it gave me hope. It gave me a lot of hope. I'm really, really proud to come back here and share some of these successes with you and some of this journey because we should all have a little bit of hope. Also because Larry Elder's not governor, y'all. <laughs> but we have a lot of work still to do. And we've come pretty far, but we've got a long way to go until we have equity in California. We will have equity when black, brown, poor, indigenous, LGBTQ plus children have the same opportunities as their white cisgendered male peers across all markets. We will have equity when you can't predict the life outcomes of a third grader based on their test scores. We'll have equity when we invest in the communities that have historically been divested from at the same rate we've invested in communities that have had abundance since the day before forever. But I believe that day is gonna come. When that day comes, we can really start to fight for justice. But I'm looking forward to being on this journey with all of you. Being here today fills my soul. People ask me, you, you ever get tired? You ever get tired running, running around the streets with Joseph? You ever get tired doing research and reading and taking flights to tell people they're doing it wrong? You ever get tired? I don't. I never get tired because being in spaces like this with other people who get up every single day and fight for things bigger than themselves, that fills me up. And I hope this conference today, shout out to SJLI, filled everybody up because we needed it. Thank you. <laughs>